My next guest once won a Peabody Award for the excellence of his television program shortly after the program went off the air. Uh, he was said to have a button-down mind then, and we'll see whether it's buttoned or zipped or what. Now, will you welcome, please, the very funny Bob Newhart, Ray Yacht. <laughs> What? 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 Who was that? <laughs> I knew, I saw that face. The face was familiar? Yeah. That was a famous film star. You're good on faces, aren't you? <laughs> do you know I the... get that all the time. They yeah. ask me what my name is. Do they? They do say, you're... do they ever well, think, they think you're me? they think they went to high Yeah. There was I a time that. where people thought I was you, and yeah. I don't know whether one of us has changed or what. Well, I, I certainly haven't. Yeah. Well, I, I haven't either. <laughs> Maybe the people have. Did you just get back from Australia or somewhere so far distant that you're probably still suffering from jet lag? I was, uh, well, I was there in um, October, which I'd had oh. an offer for four awesome. years to go to Australia. And what put me off was a flight, because I don't particularly enjoy flying. I think you coined the phrase white knuckles, didn't white -knuckle you, for flight. flies? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you can't go through life sitting in your living room. You have to get on a plane every so often. Mm -hmm. And so I steeled myself in 18 hours down to Australia. We did it in one fell swoop. And I spent 18 hours just staring at the seatbelt sign, waiting <laughs> for it to light. And they didn't have, it was an airline I won't mention, but they didn't have a lot of frills and extras on this particular airline. They didn't have movies or stereo. They had a, um, they gave you a book and you had to flip the pages real fast. <laughs> sort of there. a man riding a bicycle. Their, on, their idea. On, yeah. <laughs> So it made it a long flight. Yeah, I guess it would. Uh, you know, I didn't realize this, but you, you and I have something in common you may not know. We both had morning television shows in our day. Well, you, you, had, you had a network show. It, this was a reunion to come here, because your director, Dave Beinheiser, was my director in Chicago. At one time, Dave was directing a show that I was on, and yeah. uh, Bill Daly, who was on I Dream of Jeannie, was the floor manager, and Mike Douglas was the production singer with Joe Galicchio's band. We were all, all that talent. It's, it's hard to believe in one. Oh, on a morning one show. Studio. Yeah. No, I did a show. It wasn't that particular show. Oh. I did another show uh, in the morning. Uh, it was opposite Captain Kangaroo and Today. Both? It was opposite both? At the same time, yes. Wow. And we got one card in 16 weeks. <laughs> You had a, a horrible feeling that no one at all was watching the show, that even the cameraman would look away during the show. <laughs> that is incredible. In 16 awful. weeks, one postcard poured in? And they asked about something that was on a table. Where could I get that lighter that you had? <laughs> <laughs> so the trivia expert's um, real test would be if he knew the name of that show. <laughs> yes. and all that. What was the name of it? It was called the Tom Racine Show. I was, I was going under the name. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, I was, um, I was, he was, he would interview people on the street, and this was mm. in 1960, when people were not that, that was the first show they thought of when they came up with television, when DeForest mm. came up with it, he must have turned to someone and said, why don't we do a man on the street show? You know, and they did that in 49, yeah. but by 1960, they couldn't have cared less about a television camera on the street, and didn't want to be bothered talking to anyone, yeah. and they would just rush by us, and we'd have to grab them, and... <laughs> And I was always a strange, I always had a strange occupation. Uh, every day I had a different occupation. And one day I realized uh, that we were in trouble because I, uh, he interviewed me and he said, uh, what do you do? I said, I'm a doctor. And he said, well, it's rather unusual you're being downtown at this hour of the morning. And I explained that I had had a, an emergency appendectomy at uh, 10 o'clock that night. Uh -huh. And uh, it turned out we had complications and uh, uh, I put the patient on the table at 10 and uh, closed the patient up at uh, 6.30. And, uh, I'm sure I closed these. <laughs> and rushed into a subway tunnel and one woman called and said he should be disbarred from the... They thought it was an actual The only day she'd seen the show and she didn't recognize you. But <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, when we get back, I want to ask you if you still wake up in the morning and, and say, thank God I'm still not filming Catch-22. Because <laughs> um, I've heard so many things about the people who were stuck down there in the desert on that. We'll be right back after this message of interest.
Oh, I'm back, and we're talking with Bob Newhart. He, uh, uh, I asked you about Catch-22 before, but um, maybe you, it's long past now, but you were one of the people who was down there in the desert for weeks and living with Gila monsters. And... Well, I was, actually, it's not, I was lucky because I got to come back several times, but there were, mm -hmm. like Alan Arkin and uh, Dick Benjamin, Paul Apprentice, um, were down there all the time. And the highest rate of suicide is in San Francisco and Switzerland. They're very pretty countries, and beauty has an effect on people, apparently. And it was, it was beautiful, as opposed to certain parts of Mexico, like they say Durango was a very bad location. This was not a terrible location, mm -hmm. but it was so stark that people were going, like we're going crazy, but no one knew it because we were all together, so there was, no, <laughs> there was nothing there was to measure it against. No normal backdrop to judge. <laughs> you know and Norm Fell and I came back from about three weeks off, and we were on the plane going down to, to Tucson, where we had, then we flew Area Naves from uh, Tucson to uh, Wymus, which was a flight I never cherished, Area Naves, because the, the entire cockpit of the Area Naves plane is a shrine. It's all religious medals and rosaries. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> it was sort of in the hands of someone else, I had the feeling, mm -hmm. and the pilots really didn't know other. And he said, what do you think the stories will be? And I said, well, I don't think there'll be any stories. It'll come out gradually. Yeah. So we got back down there, and we said, well, what happened? You know, while we were gone. And they said, well, nothing, really pretty quiet. They had, one day we didn't get a shot because the sun was. And two weeks later, we were having dinner in the hotel, and someone said, I, I have to go to Wymus this week because uh, I haven't been there since the, uh, the elephant's funeral. <laughs> And I, both Norm and I knew there were no elephants native to that part Mexico. Of the world. Right. And they explained, they said, oh, that's right, you weren't here. But it turned out there was a circus going from uh, Hermosillo to Wymus. Mm -hmm. And they were carrying the elephant on a flatbed truck. And it turned around a corner and the elephant kind of leaned. And a oh. Greyhound bus ran right into the elephant. Oh. And killed the elephant. So that was actually something that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't see that every day. <laughs> Say, speaking of strange things, would you ever go back into weekly television again um, with all you know about it? And I had a feeling when you finished you didn't want to do that anymore. Well, no, the feeling was I was unprepared, really, for it. I mean, it was... Um, Thank you. I, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to, uh, to do a series. I'm doing yeah. a pilot, which hopefully will become a series. A different kind of situation, comedy as opposed to live. Mm -hmm. But I was, um, shortly after my record happened in 1960, I was approached to do a series that year, a live variety show, and there was no reason to believe that I would be able to do it. I mean, but yeah. it, I just happened to have a hot record, so they approached me. And I waited a year and did a show and still wasn't ready for it. I mean, it's something you, you have to spend years in the business learning the mistakes that other people made before you can do it. I'm very proud of the show. Yeah. It was a good show. But part of the problem with the show with me, I thought, I thought, I mean, because you just... Yeah. And now you're old and wise enough, though, you think, to not make... I don't want to travel that much. So. Yeah. I'm selling out, Dick, is really what it is. Is that what it is? <laughs> Lost all your principles, all yes. your standards? Yeah. But do you have that complaint that people, when they come from New York out here, often have that they don't feel they, they work as hard because they're more relaxed out here and they don't produce as well? And... I don't. I, I found I work better in New York I was mm -hmm. doing a show in New York um, called The Entertainers with Carol Burnett, and because of the weather, uh, you constantly make excuses about being able to uh, do it tomorrow and I'll play golf or something or lie by the pool. And mm -hmm. I mean, ideally, the best show would, would be from, say, Seattle, where it rains all the time. <laughs> or maybe but the North Pole. But you can Pole. name on one hand the number of great shows from Seattle, network shows. I can't remember more than two or three right <laughs> now. <laughs> come to think of it. You know, something that bothered me in Catch-22, you disappeared out the window in your scene, and you never reappeared. That was the end of my appearance, yes. Oh, that's probably why that's you why never reappeared. I had no more lines, that's, that's why. If, if yeah. I had had more lines, I would have been in the picture later on. Yeah, but the absence of further dialogue precluded your reappearing. Yeah. There yeah. was a, a similar situation with, uh, with James Mason he, in uh, A Star is Born. His last scene he was walking into the scene, walking into the ocean. Remember that scene? Right, famous. Scene. And the next movie he made was uh, Seven Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. 
That's true. I never thought of that. There's a certain continuity. Well, oh, let's take this message. I forgot. We'll be right back. Stay where you are.